Well, we have this Sunday and next Sunday before we take the summer off. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that we may finish our, our work through the New Testament in the next two weeks. Um, I don't know if we'll get to Revelation or not before the break, but um, maybe I'll have the break to work on Revelation. So that would be nice uh, if we don't get it all the way through. Uh, we're, if you're, I think everybody, I recognize all the faces. I don't think I have to give a big introduction. So now yeah, we're working this week, starting into the epistles. Actually, we'll, we'll back up to Acts a little bit. There's a lot of politics in Acts, which we, I wish we had more time to go into, but we'll, we'll just touch on Acts and then move into the epistles, some of the passages in the epistles that relate directly to government and politics. Uh, I, I just, I had a thought that struck me and I wrote it down <laughs> when we were singing our last couple of songs in the service this morning. And um, the, the, the song that we sang, I'm, I'm fighting the battle that you've already won. It, it's, that resonate with some of you too. And it actually kind of clicked with me in the way that Pastor Zeke was talking about prayer as well. Like why... Christ has already won, right? In a sense, Satan has been defeated. Uh, and yet, the battle is still very, very real. It's not a fake battle, right? He, he has already won, and yet we're still in a very real fight. And why, why, is, why did God design it that way? Like, why, why does he just not clear the field, and we just skip forward to the new heavens and the new earth when evil is all gone, Right? And so, so I, th- I think this is maybe a little bit speculation, but I think it's informed by the biblical story too. I, I really do think, obviously, that the victory that Christ has accomplished is real. The, the battle is real. Um, I think part of the reason why we're still in a real battle is that we are being trained to reign and to rule, right? God, so I think of this as a parenting example too. Like I could solve, well, I probably couldn't solve all my kids' problems. If I were God, I could solve all my kids' problems, right? But, but I don't. Some, some parents are tempted to try to solve all their kids' problems. Why is that not good for our kids? Because they need, they need the development of their character as they are working through the, the problems that life brings, right? And we, as, as sons and daughters of God, we need the continued ongoing development of our character in Christ-likeness. And part of fighting this very real battle is that preparation to reign and to rule in the new heavens and the new earth. And... Yeah, I, I, think that's, I think that's a very real part of, of why God lets us uh, go through very real battles, even though the war is already won. Does that make sense? So that, that was just, uh, that kind of struck me in a new way this morning. Well, James 1, James is very clear about when troubles come, Yeah. Being fully developed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite authors has said, you know, some, some people who are who get into heaven, this is this is not a theologically correct statement, but by the skin of their teeth, like undiscipled, un um, they're saved, but not uh, discipled into the likeness of Jesus. What one of my favorite authors said, like some people aren't going to know what to do when they first get to heaven because they, for much of their life, has been oriented against discipleship to Christ. Like um, I, this is this is the realm of speculation, but there, we we are in the process of being oriented toward God's thoughts and oriented toward His view on reality, and you can be more or less oriented toward God's thoughts, right? Uh, the, the way Zeke described it this morning is he, if, if we're in Christ, that's locked in. 
and God is for us and we belong to him, but we can be more or less attentive to him and what he's doing, right? And so I, anyway, I think, I think the battle is a big part of that process. So, um, so that kind of transitions, segues nicely into the, the early church, well, I say the first thousand plus years of the church, made a big deal out of, and they placed it in the creeds, they made a big deal out of not just the, the birth of Christ and the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, but they also made a big deal out of the ascension of Christ. And it's not something we think about very often, I think, in evangelical circles, but the, the church calendar placed a big emphasis on the ascension. What, what, what is, why would the ascension, so what, what do we mean when, we, when we're talking about the ascension of Christ? It's an event, a particular event in, in history. Right? It's, yeah, Mike. Matthew 28, the last appearance before the disciples at the ascension mm-hmm. of the Father. It's one of the biggest promises, mm-hmm. commandments there is in the whole New Testament of what he said in that last conversation to the disciples. Right. That's exactly right. It's, yeah, Matthew 20. And where does he ascend to? When he disappears from their sight, the right hand of the, to the right hand of the throne of the so these are these are political uh, concepts at least in part political right so so he is he is now reigning and ruling at the right hand of the Father uh, is that is that strictly a spiritual <laughs> far off distant thing in the sky? Uh, the, the, the early church didn't think so. That they, uh, they connected it closely to... Uh, so the Son of Man presented before the Ancient of Days takes his throne and receives his kingdom, and he now reigns. And they connected that to Psalm 2. They connected it to Daniel 7, uh, which talks about the, the, the Son of Man taking his place at the Father's right hand and reigning um, yeah. Isn't the Great Commission prefaced with all power is given to me? All authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Yeah. Therefore, go and make disciples, right? teaching them to do, to obey all that I've commanded you. Right? Yeah, that's all connected in ways that I, I haven't thought about very deeply for much of my Christian life, but I've been thinking about it more recently. So, so in the resurrection, God the Father vindicates the life, the work, the action of, of God the Son, right? And, and though that's not visible to the entire world at that time, um, in no way is that a private act, right? God's reign and his rule are, are a public reality. And... And then very shortly after that, we have the establishment of the church at Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit. And now the church is is the primary, I mean, we're called the body of Christ. Christ still has a body at the right hand of the Father, and he has a body on earth uh, filled by the Spirit. And, And the church is the body of Christ not just a metaphor, but a real thing in the world. And it's a living testament to the triumph of God over sin and death and hell. Uh, and, and the battle rages on, right? But the church is now at the forefront of that uh, battle as a victorious uh, entity. Go ahead, Newton. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, the, the Christ, Christ establishes the church, right? And, and says, you're going to be my, my body. Christ is the head of, of his body, right? But, but the church, is the, church is, the, is the one entity that is living out the kingdom of God 
on earth. It's the, it's the entity that Christ ordained to be his living representatives, living out his kingdom on earth in this in-between age of the, the already and the not yet, the first coming and the second coming. So if I wanted to act like the church did not exist and that all of this was fictitious, right. um, could I reasonably say that the body of Christ does not exist? No, it, it is an actual reality that Christ established, right? We, we say, and, and there, is a, there is a truth to this, that going to church doesn't make you a Christian just like being in a garage doesn't make you a car. That, that's true. But there is no, on the, on the New Testament menu of options, there's no option for being a Christian and not being in the church, <laughs> right? The, the church is meant to be the place where the individual believer makes his home, right? Yeah. I'm not aiming to pull out. Just... No, that's no, it's a it's a it's a good question. I appreciate. <laughs> Sometimes we all have a temptation to pull out, right? But uh, yeah, that's not on the menu. So uh, I, this is this is just a. This is a massive set of concepts and we're just hitting it in one slide. So I apologize. We could spend a whole morning on this. A any thoughts before we move on from, from the ascension? <coughs> we'll, we'll keep moving. Um, so, so in this new reality, that is the, the death and the resurrection and, and Christ's triumph over, over sin and death and hell, um, earthly authorities, earthly governments, earthly political institutions, they are granted by God a limited authority, a limited legitimate form of governance, but right, they're also permanently held to account. Right? They no longer get to claim, as, as all human governments did for all of history, claim to be godlike, claim to have a, the backing of heaven, um, claim a, a certain autonomy, right? They, they're, they're no longer as if they ever were. They, they, they never were, but they, they could perhaps claim to be. But since Christ's victory, they can no longer claim to be unchecked and autonomous, right? And, and the church stands in the world as a real thing, and as a, as a constant reminder to uh, the world and to earthly governments that a final judgment is really and truly coming. Does that make sense? <clears throat> uh, so the church is not uh, strictly a political institution in the way we think of political institutions, but it has, has very real implications for political institutions, institutions of government. Um, and, and so here's a question, uh, throw this out there. To what extent are earthly governments, to what extent are they compatible with the mission of the church? We're going we're gonna to unpack that with some passages from the epistles this morning. Tom, go ahead. That's the next passage we're going to look at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I love it when you guys are like one step ahead of me. <laughs> um, so uh, this, is, this is an issue that the church has been wrestling with for 2,000 years, right? Trying to, trying to work this out. Uh, the, the nature of the relationship between the church and earthly governments. But... The epistles have some thoughts, <laughs> so we're going to look at those this morning. So the first passage, Tom just mentioned it. It's from 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, this is a letter from Paul to a young pastor, Timothy, who's pastoring the church in Ephesus. And this is what Paul says. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, that was the word used in the 
Ephesians this morning. Uh, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So what, uh, what, what, are the, what are some political implications you see from this paragraph in terms of earthly, earthly government and politics? Yeah. Well, peaceful and quiet would be opposite to war mm -hmm. and safety. And violence and unrest and, yeah. Yeah. This is one of the things we're... Zeke mentioned this this morning, but we're, we're supposed to pray for things that we know are within the alignment to God's purposes, right? What, anything else you... Yeah, godly is technically not capitalized in English, so. I, I missed the implication, the, the prayers that their wicked designs would be thwarted, mm. and the reminder that God, that regardless of, of how evil they, they are, God will, will, when in the end, I, I had sort of hoped that, we, that I would be urged to do all I can to put up a barrier mm. of resistance. <laughs> of resistance. Yeah, yeah. It, it heightens the tension to know that when Paul wrote this letter, Nero was the emperor, <laughs> right? And Nero was eventually going to kill Paul. Yeah. But it is, it is not clear exactly how these people act or why. Mm. Uh, like Meaning the, 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 the earthly authorities, yeah. Sometimes, especially in the Old Testament, we see war as an act of God's judgment and punishment. I don't think we ever see it as a, as a result of, it's not ever a happy thing, right? In, in most of these passages we're going to look at, there's a connection between this peaceful and quiet life uh, and this, this last sentence, what, 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 could that, what could that possible connection be? Tease that out a little bit. It has to do with people who in their heart return to do what is right have a lot easier time getting along with each other than people who are out living selfishly and determining to get everything they can and take advantage of everybody around them. Mm -hmm. They're necessarily more... What's the word I'm looking for? Um, there's more strife in those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if everybody is, is att 
attempting their best to do what they know is right. Mm -hmm. It smooths out the road a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I couldn't help but think of, well, that's, that's the next point here, but I couldn't help but think of the resonance with Jeremiah 29, where they're asked, they're told to, to pursue a peaceful, quiet life. Um, uh, but, but also, Ro Rome was a mixed, <laughs> it was a mixed bag, a mixed blessing. What was, what is one of the things Rome was famous for as an empire was its uh, transportation systems, its law and order, its relative uh, orderly uh, system, right? Um, now, that, that order was sometimes purchased with a whole lot of violence. <laughs> uh, but, but the book of Acts, you see the gospel going out over a Roman transportation network. And, and what, what's, what's Paul's relationship to the Roman government frequently in the book of Acts? This is curious. I hadn't thought of this. That's another author pointed this out. He is frequently imprisoned, but um, his final, not his final imprisonment, his, the, the imprisonment that's most famous when he wrote these letters, how did that come about? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and why did he appeal to, to, to a trial before Rome? Because he was a citizen, but, but there was a specific set of circumstances. Well, and, and there, was, there was an assassination attempt on his life by the Jewish re religious leaders. That was, his, that was his way of getting an all-expenses all trip paid to Rome, <laughs> where he wanted to spread the gospel. But it also kept him from getting killed, right? assassinated by, there was this plot on the part of the Jewish religious leaders to assassinate him. They took a vow, remember, remember that. that? And that's when he appeals to Rome. What's that? <clears throat> right. <laughs> right. So, so in a sense, you see often Paul appealing to the, the law system, the legal system of Rome. Uh, it's not ideal, but it keeps him from getting killed, and, and it gets him safe transport to Rome. And he's, he's living under arrest, but it's a, it's a relatively benign house arrest. He still has freedom of movement for, for the gospel, right? He's writing these letters and, and he's able to send them out to the churches even though he's under house arrest, right? I mean, does the peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified, speak to how we as the church can with the government as well? I, I think so. I, I think that the, the thing that this is, I'm learning in all of this process too. And one thing that, that has dawned on me a lot in this process is that Christianity really, as you see it in the New Testament, is not a, not a revolutionary in the sense of let's take up arms and overthrow the government. It's, it's very much revolutionary in an underground subversive way, but not in a violent let's, let's charge, uh, let's let's charge the capital in Rome with, with an army, right? It, it works much more, it does work and it brings down the Roman system, but it does it very much underground, very much subversively, rather than through violent opposition. I think it's amazing what you've done in this class by bringing this, it's opened my eyes to what Paul's actually doing this very same passage could be affirmed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. To live a quiet life, work with your hands, mind your own business. It's really diffusing uh, the political emotions of the day, mm -hmm. which this has certainly diffused a lot of my political emotions mm -hmm. by pointing this out. But also Paul's doing is 
explaining our identity in Christ in the kingdom in all of this, we should have peace in that. We should mm-hmm. have joy in that. And regardless mm-hmm. of our circumstances, politically, right. we're of a... What's he said that... Was it today? I'm an ambassador in chains. Right. I'm shared from. Right. Well, what is an ambassador? It's a place of position in a foreign country. Mm-hmm. But you are in that position as Paul was saying, even though he was in chains, he was not from that mm-hmm. lo- location. He was right. A citizen in the kingdom of God. Yeah. And, and Paul's, I think you could make a case, Paul's number one concern is the spread of the gospel, right? And uh, if the government, uh, we should pray for a government that that doesn't impede that, but, but actually provides conditions under which the spread of the gospel is easier. So, so I, I think of a lot, because we lived in Asia for 10 years, I think China comes up in my mind a lot. But I, I think of China in really similar ways to Rome 2,000 years ago. I mean, it's, a, it's an empire that has uh, a semblance, of, it, it's a safe piece of, you know, if you're not a dissident, it's a safe place. <laughs> if you don't take on the government, it's a safe place. They, they have massively expanded their transportation and road systems. And the gospel has really been able to flourish uh, over the last 50 years. Um, it, you know, when, when you see, so you see missionary situations where there's a literal civil war going on in a country and the missionaries usually have to leave, right? And that's kind of the opposite of what Paul is talking about. He, I, don't, I think Paul would have operated just fine in China. Um, I mean, there, there are constraints, but, but to him, the, the big thing is, is the gospel going out or not? And it was in Rome under, under much less than perfect leaders and it is in China. Um, and so, yeah, he, he wasn't as concerned about the, the form of government as he was about uh, the ability for the gospel to, to circulate freely. Does that make sense? And we're going to see that theme keep popping up in these passages. Yeah, are you going to let rioting run run free, or are you going to say, no, we're not going to do yeah, this? Right. That's how we do it, except the Wall Street Journal. Three campuses and how they dealt with it. Right. The one his was much more peaceful than some of the other ones. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so so I, I would argue that the, the epistles, in the epistles, the goals of government are restructured. They're, they're much more humble. Um, they're no longer for the self-aggrandizement, the, the self-glory of Caesar and the leaders. Now, the goals of government, they're meant to bring peace and peace that facilitates the spread of the gospel. Um, there's a, governments are sort of housebroken and domesticated and humbled, right? And that doesn't mean that all governments go along, right? Some, some of them very definitely don't, but, but they are uh, judged by the standard of, of the kingship of, of Christ, the reign of Christ, and they will ultimately be held accountable for when they do bad things, right? Does that make sense? So, yeah, we mentioned this. We see this frequently in Acts when Roman law protects Paul against the attempts of the religious leaders to to assassinate, in extra-legal assassination uh, attempts of Paul. Um, Here's a... we've, We've looked at this passage frequently, but I think it's worth looking at again. He, that is Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, 
and here's some political words, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, and I know when they, when they, this was a hymn of the early church, we think, that Paul was quoting. <clears throat> um, I, I know they were th- also thinking, they were thinking spiritual powers, political powers, and they didn't necessarily distinguish <laughs> between the evil spiritual powers and evil political powers because they're really not, <laughs> they are connected, right? Um, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And then one chapter later, in Colossians 2, uh, he says that we are buried with him, with Christ, in baptism. We're raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. He, here's the sentence I'm thinking of, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. If you're a Roman and you read that, you're like, wait a minute, I thought he got killed. <laughs> right? He, he disarmed uh, the rulers and authorities and then later says, uh, you know, that having nailed them to the cross, right? So what, again, we talked about this a lot last week. What looked like his defeat was ultimately his triumph. Um, and ultimately, it was, the, it was the disarming of the rulers and authorities, be they spiritual authorities of darkness or, or <coughs> earthly political uh, rulers and authorities, which he would have seen as connected. And, and in, his, in his death, he triumphs over them and, and strips them of their uh, mystical, godlike ability. Tom, or... You probably covered this last week. I wasn't here. But I'm, I'm echoing back to Jesus saying, don't fear those who can kill the body. Mm-hmm. And that, that whole triumph over death is, is a part of that victory over politics. If that's all they have. Right. <laughs> right. Um, right. And if that, if that goes away, I mean, then they have no power over you. <laughs> we've seen it politically in, in right. our day in various right. countries right. where the people no longer care if the government comes in and kills them. And the government can't really do anything. That's a powerful thing when you don't care if you live or die. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, Newton. Uh, Mm-hmm. With the, sim- the, the simple, unpleasant act of forgiving somebody, it, they're not clearly connected in the scriptures, <coughs> but it just seems to be the same issue. <coughs> Am I willing to? bow before earthly government because I have bowed first Mm -hmm. to the God of the universe. Mm -hmm. And and really, it should be much easier to bow before (coughs) earthly rulers having with me first having Mm -hmm. bowed before the God of the universe. So, and then how do I, somebody offends, I mean, somebody really does something wrong to me. And what they've done is done, and there's no undoing it. And I'm just supposed to let that go? Well, if I bow first to the God of the universe and give him that 
loss and that injustice, then I can let it go. Mm. But if I'm not willing to bow first, and, and so if I'm unwilling to forgive or unwilling to, it, to bow before government, it seems to me that it's because I have in that matter not really bowed to the king of the universe. Mm. And it doesn't. <coughs> For me, I don't see how it means anything but that. Mm. I, I think that's a really valid point. The connection between, because forgiveness of another person is not a denial of justice. It's saying a real injustice may have incurred, may have occurred, but vengeance is ultimately God's. He will repay. And so you're, 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 dis, you're absolving yourself of the responsibility of, of achieving justice. You're, you're, you're rolling it over onto God. And, and either, either that, that judgment for the real injustice, either it will <coughs> fall on Christ or it will fall eventually upon that individual. And it, it's... It's not a denial of justice, it's a, it's a deferment of justice, either deferred to, to Christ or deferred to the final judgment, right? And you're saying, I, I'm not responsible uh, as an individual. Now, now governments are responsible for, for justice, but, but I'm not personally responsible for bringing judgment on this person. I'm not well equipped because I'm a person who uh, would rather traffic in mercy. <laughs> Than, than judgment, because judgment wouldn't go well for me either. Perfect, perfect justice wouldn't wouldn't work out well for me either. <laughs> yeah, that I think that's a that's a really great point. <clears throat> so here's uh, th there's kind of three really famous passages on the, the first one Tom mentioned in, in First Timothy. There's a second one in Romans 13. This is Paul writing uh, a letter to, to the church at Rome. It says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. As a good American, I... I, miss, I sort of bristle up immediately at the portions of this. That I, I immediately start to rush in my mind to the exceptions. Like, well, what about when they're not? <laughs> right? But let, let, before we rush on to that, uh, we'll, we'll get on to what about when the government is not properly functioning. But before we do that, let's just let's take this passage for what it is. Um, what, what do you see in here? What are the positive affirmations of government? Earthly government in this in this passage. <clears throat> God gave us the authority. Mm -hmm. He instituted it. Yeah. And appointed it. And uh, you know, from there, there's where the yeah. positive are. Right. Yeah. Earthly human governments are, uh, are are a good thing. They're they're appointed by God, right? Uh, there, there is. I don't think there's a place for Christian anarchism 
ever. <laughs> this passage makes me, I just popped in my mind when <clears throat> Babylon was besieging Jerusalem. Hmm. And Jeremiah was saying, Yeah. Um, if you want to live, surrender. Yeah. I am determined to hand you over to him. And if you fight, you're, you will die. Guaranteed. Yeah. And, yeah. and it, was Jeremiah's it, message a popular message <laughs> when he took that to the court? <laughs> no, he was very unpatriotic. They threw him down a well. <laughs> right. it's, yeah, it's not like the king of Babylon was going to be. No, it's not like he was a nice guy. <laughs> yeah. That that was a specific. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar was specifically God's judgment upon the nation of Israel for their sin, right? For their idolatry and 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 unrepentant, continued sinfulness. Right? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll break this down a little bit. Um, according to this passage, what are some of the legitimate functions of government? It's to be a check on evil. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, That's, that's one of the primary ones that, that sort of comes through in this passage, right? And we all know, like, defund the police. <laughs> Anybody with common sense knows... That's not going to end very well, right? If, if, if you have a problem with lawlessness, so let's take the police out of it and see if that goes better. Right? These places are like, ah, can we have the police back, um, even though they're not perfect? <laughs> right? well, there will also be behavior is not against the law when the law hasn't been broken. Right. So it's not lawless anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what a naive thing. Oh, right. No, um, and... and and he mentions the, the sword, right? The sword is sort of a it's, a, it's emblematic of, there, there is actual force that's sometimes required, right? Like a, that's why a police don't carry around just megaphones, they carry around guns, right? <laughs> because sometimes the, the bad guys aren't going to just listen when you tell them to stop, right? Um, do what is good and you will receive his approval. So th there's a, there is a, it's, it's a little bit implied, but there's a judicial function. The, the government does have to, to judge between good and evil, right? Like a legal system is a, what is a, a legal system but judges determining uh, good versus evil, right? right versus wrong. <clears throat> um, and then in verse 4 of that Romans 13 passage, the government is called an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Uh, to punish and restrain, as Elliot, you mentioned this, bad con conduct, even with force, right, with the sword. These things aren't difficult for us. Imagine, right? I think that's why it's so offensive when you have a jury corrupt. Right, right. You know, because it's not doing those things. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, this is maybe an uncomfortable, <laughs> an uncomfortable uh, idea too. But he, collecting taxes is apparently a legitimate function of the government. <clears throat> now, there's prudential questions within that about how much taxes should the government reasonably collect. And, and that is, that's a subject for legitimate discussion and debate, I think is, uh, um, it's not carte blanche to take all of the money from the citizenry. We, we can debate how much is, but there is, but there is some legitimate function for gov earthly governments to collect taxes to uh, support um, law and order systems. Uh, 
thoughts on this? What do you think about when governments get into, so you get into the socialism versus <laughs> other forms of government. So they get into providing things that the church was. Right. Or they're trying to, or rebalance, um, right. I mean, clearly redistri redistribution of, of right. income, yeah. Clearly in those roles, I think most people can agree that, you know, the judicial, from a, from a security mm -hmm. side equation, yeah. it's pretty easy to see the government, that's really a strong government role. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, it's going to be fun. Luther had some interesting thoughts, uh, Martin Luther, on the, the social services components of the church versus the government. We're going to look at some of those specific things because at the time Paul wrote, the government was not providing a social safety net for people. The church was doing that. And then over time, as society, as the church becomes a legitimate conscience for society, then the government starts to say, uh, maybe we should provide a safety net for the... And, and then uh, there's, judici there's, there's uh, prudential questions of wisdom, like how much should be the church, how much should be the... When does the safety net become a when does the, Yeah, when does the safe, safety net become actually corrosive of human character, right? Uh, yeah. It's it, it it is yeah, from the very yeah, first Thessalonians. So so there's a clue that early on, all of these <clears throat> destitute people, orphans, widows coming into the church. There's a clue right there that already at the beginning, some people were trying to take advantage of the system, right? And Paul's like, don't don't do that. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it was enough of an issue that Paul issues a warning. Uh, if you're able to work, you should work. You shouldn't, you shouldn't uh, sap off of the, you know, off the church. If there are kids who shouldn't be supporting this woman, they should do it. Yeah, yeah. So th th those are, these are political issues with political undertones for sure, yeah. Uh, here's, here's the, uh, another of the most famous passages it's from first Peter two. So this is, this is Peter now writing to a, to a church, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evil doers, not if, but when <laughs> they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. What what do you see in here that's either an expansion of what we've already talked about or or a repetition of what we've already talked about? When he brings up freedom, that's the to me at least in this set of verses the most subversive of the statements that he makes that you are not subject to wrong in any real sense, but. It is an acknowledgement that there is a higher authority that I serve. And at that point, I don't. I live as a servant of God, not as a servant of God. Mm -hmm. To the extent that they coincide and work together, great. <coughs> but. We, well, go ahead, sorry, finish your. That's, that's, that's fine. I, it's just that whole. But it's, but it's done with honor. It's not a, I'm, I'm the actual one here, and you are the scumbag. But it's, but it's there. 
Mm -hmm. that, that concept that I represent, the God who rules us both. Right. And, and within, within this passage, there's already uh, a hint that sometimes governments are not going to right. do the right thing, right? right? When they speak against you as evildoers for, for doing good, right? They're, they're calling you evil when you're doing good. But uh, you're living, if you're living in, in alignment to God's truth, eventually it's going to come out in the wash, right? Uh, on, it, may, may not, it may have to wait until the day of visitation. <laughs> What's the day of visitation? That's, that's the second coming, I, I think. That's how I read that. When all things come out in the wash, right? Um, but he says, um, yeah, by, by doing good, uh, you, you put to silence the ignorance of foolish people, which I assume includes uh, governmental leaders, <laughs> right? Um, so so whether, they, whether they acknowledge the good or not, you live, you live righteously, faithfully, and it, it will come out in the wash, right? There's a real sense of humility in all of these passages mm -hmm. <laughs> relative to government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is what we, I mean, we do not see that when you turn the TV on. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Or, you know, yeah. Right. Right. suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah. That's <laughs> 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 Short, short on warm, fuzzy passages, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but long on, on hope and confidence and faith, right? The evidence of things not yet seen, right? Yeah. But I think in America, where we do get in that with the government, it's very clear that we can, we're set up how we should interact with mm -hmm. No, there's no spot in there at which we can do that without a humble sense and a grace-filled conversation. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And we, we go back to those passages in the Gospels where Jesus, on two different occasions, pays taxes, but he does it with a wry smile, like... It's no skin off of my back because my father owns everything. <laughs> so what's the big, you know, yeah. And it's, it's not uncontrovertational sometimes. I mean, right. You know, you pilot, it's pretty blunt. Yeah, we looked at that last week. We spent the whole week on, on John 18 and 19 with Pilate. And, and Jesus has submitted himself yeah. to an unjust trial, <laughs> Right. But, but, at the, but underlying all of it is like when Pilate says, 
you know, I hold you in my hand, and Jesus is like, nope, I hold you in my hand. <laughs> right. Yeah, nobody's ever talked to Pilate that way. Right. You don't, seem to, you don't seem to understand the seriousness of your leadership. <laughs> right. You know? uh, right. And it's like, yeah, I, I understand how serious it is, but I've, I've got a God who controls it all. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, we didn't even finish this passage. <laughs> First Peter 2, uh, going on uh, after... After the first paragraph, servants be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Is this warm and fuzzy enough for you, Newton? <laughs> What's that? For to this you have been called. Yeah, yeah. Not exactly the calling most of us are looking for. Right. You've been called to do good and suffer. Yeah. It certainly isn't fuzzy. It's clear. <laughs> <laughs> it's warm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's some, some thoughts. <laughs> I think as Americans, our instincts are almost always to side with revolutionaries. L look at any movie. H how many movies can you think of where the, uh, the good guys are the, those in authority and the bad guys are the rebels? The, the, the good guys are always the rebels in American movies. <laughs> right? um, Name a movie whose heroes are the establishment and the rebels are unlikable. <laughs> right. um, good luck finding one of those. Um, it is our national myth, if you will. Um, we, we inher I inherently bristle at passages that speak of authority, whether that's authority in governments, authority in the home, authority in the church, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We, we bristle up at at thoughts of authority, Be, because we know, uh, one of the reasons is because we know authority can genuinely go badly, right? Can genuinely be corrupt. And we, we immediately rush to all of the examples about what, what about this, right? And those are all real. That's what America is about. <clears throat> right, right. But for most of human history, revolutions are, are a bloody mess in which everybody loses and nobody wins, right? Um, uh, so these passages from the, the, sometimes called the household rules passages of Ephesians 5, and Colossians 3, 1 Timothy 6, Titus 2. These are, they talk about the order of things and submission. Uh, these are not popular. <laughs> These are not popular American passages, right? Um, uh, we're out on time. We're, we're about out of time. Um, we are we are going to we are going to spend time exploring. What do we do when? What is a Christian's response when you're clearly in corrupt um, situations and unjust situations? Do you sit and? just strictly sit and take it, um, whether that's on a governmental scale, whether that's in a home and a family, whether that's in a church. Um, it's, a, it's a complex issue. We're going we're gonna to dig into this more. Um, 
not pretending any of this is easy, right? <clears throat> you are going to take a nine or ten week break, though. <laughs> right. right? Maybe you'll forget about it, everything we. Uh, <laughs> if I don't come back to it, <laughs> you'll probably still remind me. Huh? <laughs> no, I, um, yeah, these are these are hard things, right? Um, but next week is the last. Next week is the last week before the break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I think next week. I didn't think we'd get far enough to cover this this morning. We're going to look at the book of Philemon. If you want to read ahead for next week, it's a really wonderful little test case of working this out in the church in a very pastoral, churchly situation. Uh, some of the intersection between these issues of justice and submission and and how does this work out in an actual church conflict um, but we'll we'll save that for next week because we're we're about out of time so uh, final final thoughts do you think this mostly just western westernized that's a good question not not i don't think necessarily i mean i think all humans i think as humans we all kind of bristle up against this maybe it's maybe it's more an official doctrine in the west um but i i think this is offensive to general human sensibilities <laughs> Mm -hmm. And but don't use your freedom as an opportunity to cover for your wickedness. And then the very next part of that sentence, it's in the same sentence. Live as a servant of Christ. Yeah. So it's the idea of the fact that as a human being you will serve something mm -hmm. seems to be you know, like Joshua, choose this day who you will serve. Right. You know, it's not an option to not serve somebody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Christ <laughs> took on the form of a servant when he was made in the likeness of man. The mm -hmm. likeness of man is the form of a servant. We're servants of something. Mm -hmm. And so, when you're living as a servant to Christ, that's freedom. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's freedom is because there's a difference between a good decision and a bad one. Yeah. And if you can't make a good decision, you're not free. Right. So. Is that, is our, <clears throat> America has totally lost that idea. We celebrate the opportunity to make a choice. Right. And we say that the opportunity to choose is where freedom lies. Right. Instead of saying freedom lies with the ability to make the good decision. Right. Um, yeah. Is that uniquely American or is well, that? There is, I think there is something uniquely modern about <clears throat> our current concept of freedom, which is no restraint on me, whether ex external or even internal. Like. My, my own birth gender is a restraint on my freedom, right? Like that's, that's pretty uniquely modern that e even integrity of character is a restraint on my freedom, right? So, uh, you know, the, the older Augustine is most famous for the biblical view of, articulating the biblical view of freedom, which is that I'm most free when I'm living in accordance with my nature. Right with who I'm created to be, so that I don't have the picture, but there's a, there's a, there's a, sitting on a table is a fish bowl, you think a glass fish bowl, and there's a fish, goldfish jumping out of it, shouting freedom, you know, um, that's sort of the modern concept of freedom, right? <laughs> uh, or as Augustine would say, no, that the fish is most free when he's living in water. <laughs> if the fish is, the fish wants to go on a vacation. From reality and go live in the desert. That's not freedom, right? That that is the modern concept of freedom: is not to be constrained by anything, either external or or internal, which, as you point out, is not really freedom, right? 
Yeah. Yeah, you we, you could spend a lot of time unpacking. Um, is it the previous? Yeah, live as people who are free, not using your freedom. That, that's definitely the Augustine version of freedom, not the modern version of freedom, right? Uh, living as servants of God is is because that's what you were made for, right? Well, um, Tom, would you would you close us in prayer? Huh?